Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. 1 Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you've called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So Samuel went and lay down, and the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called to Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Samuel, and he said, Here I am, for, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling us at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hear. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 through 8. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Now in the New Testament, Matthew 4, 18 through 22. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. 
Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now the book of Acts 26, verses 13 through 18. The apostle Paul said, About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and what you will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. God has been calling people for a special purpose for thousands of years. Ever since Adam and Eve turned away from God's plan and hid themselves from Him, God has been reaching out, calling mankind back to Himself. And God usually uses other people to do it. Why? Well, those who won't listen to God can't hear from Him. Listening to God requires a commitment to Him and obedience to His Word and intimacy with Him. So God calls some of those who are already His and sets them apart to tell others about Him. Now, my purpose today is not to call you into ministry. Only God can do that. In fact, God's not going to call everyone into ministry. Ephesians 4, 11-13 says, And He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. A ministry calling makes you no more of a Christian and no more valuable to God than if you're not called into full-time ministry. God has a purpose and a special role for each of us, whether or not we ever wear the stole of ordination. However, if you are called, your obedience to that calling is essential. And I have found that there are four common characteristics of the divine call to ministry. The first is that it is personal. Look at the number of times God called people by name in the passages we just read. Usually He called their names twice. Moses, Moses. Samuel, Samuel, Saul, Saul. Also note that when God came to them, He went to where they were. And God spoke to different people in different ways. Yet each call required a response from the one called. You know, I grew up in a spiritually lukewarm church. And I did not know God until just after my senior year of high school. I had taken a challenge from my youth pastor to read my way through the Bible, but I was not yet convinced that that hole in my heart could only be filled when I found the right woman. (laughs) I finally found a girlfriend just before graduation, and she gave me everything I thought I wanted. Now, I knew my youth pastor had said premarital sex was wrong, but I'd been discipled more by Hollywood than I had by the church. But I decided to do something dangerous anyway. I prayed and I asked God which was right, what my youth pastor said or what I'd heard from Hollywood. I'd signed up to go on an outreach trip to the Navajo Indian Reservation in Arizona, and I told God he could let me know there. Well, After our first Sunday service, I foolishly decided to climb the big sandstone formation just outside of the town of Kayenta by myself. I struggled to climb to the top and found an even deeper canyon on the backside that I tried to scale. I got about a third of the way down and came to a point where I could not go any further. (laughs) I I reached up. I turned around and reached up and tried to hold on to the only handhold, but it was sandstone and it broke off, leaving me against just a smooth wall of rock. And suddenly, for the first time in my life, I heard the voice of God. Often gets asked, was it audible? (laughs) No, it was a lot louder than that. And I felt God speaking to me. Remember that question you asked me? What you've been doing is wrong, but more than that, I want all of you. Well, I wrestled for a few minutes on that little narrow spot on that cliff, whether or not I would surrender my life to God. But I realized if God loved me enough to answer my question, how could I not give Him everything I had? 
Well, I made that surrender, and I felt led to raise my hand again, but this, thing, this time, the next thing I knew, I was back at the top of the sandstone rock again, made my way down the front, and I've never been the same since. I started reading my Bible and praying every day, and by the end of October that year, four months later, I knew I had a call to ministry. I was going to a secular college, but it had a strong Christian fellowship. And I realized that God had not created me for the engineering I was studying. There was an awareness, an undeniable awareness that God had a different purpose in mind for me. I knew I was called and I said yes. And your calling won't be like mine or Moses' calling or Paul's calling. But look at how Timothy was called. Acts 16, 1 through 3. Paul came also to Derbe and Lystra. And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him. Not too much supernatural there. But he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Yeah, but was he called? He didn't have any burning bush or anything. But notice what Paul writes to him in 1 Timothy 4.14. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. There was something supernatural that happened to Timothy. Oh, you may be asking today, well, how do I know if I'm called? Elmer Town says to look for three criteria. Number one is a continuous burden. You just can't let it go. It's with you all the time. Number two is an abiding desire. You want to do it. And number three is fruit as you step out in ministry. And I just want to encourage you, if you think you're called, test it. Step out, volunteer, and serve. Peter writes in 2 Peter 1.10, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make sure about his calling and choosing you. And Paul told Timothy to let people who are going to be serving as leaders in the church to first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Before I got involved in full-time ministry, I worked in the nursery. I taught elementary Sunday school. I worked with the youth group. I played bass guitar and keyboard, sang on the worship team, did all kinds of outreaches. I even picked up trash. Don't get expected to get paid to do something you're not willing to do as a volunteer. <clears throat> the next thing to do, is cultivate a deep relationship with Christ. Remember, only your intimacy with Him enables you to be a vessel you can, He can use. When you answer the call, you place yourself in the front lines of spiritual warfare. You're a prime target for the enemy, and He'd love to take you down. It is horribly destructive when a pastor falls. Never think that you can stand on your own apart from Christ. A friend who once fell morally told me, you know when it comes down to it, my real failure was not loving Jesus with all my heart. Fall in love with Jesus, stay in love with Him, and study His Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the Word of truth. Develop a deep relationship with the Bible. Study it, memorize it, live by it. So as we said, God's ministry call is purposeful. But number two, it's also purposeful in addition to being personal. God always has a purpose when He calls people. Think about all those people we read. Abraham was going to be a blessing to the nations. Moses would deliver people from slavery. Samuel would restore the work of the Holy Spirit and usher in the kingdom of David. Isaiah was going to prophesy and warn Israel to come back to righteousness and predict the coming Messiah. Peter was going to feed the sheep of Israel, lead the early church. Paul would establish the church throughout the Roman Empire, write almost half the books of the New Testament. And God has a purpose for you when He calls you. He may call you to reach a specific type of people, maybe a specific country. He may be, give you a general calling to ministry. You're not going to understand until later on in life. Sometimes your calling will change over time. It took 11 years from the time I was first called until I was able to start into full-time ministry. I was always involved in leadership in my churches and ministry, and I completed a master's degree in religion while I was in the U.S. Air Force. I begged God to open the door to full-time ministry, and that finally happened when the pastor from my first Air Force assignment looked me up at the base where I was stationed in Germany. He invited me to serve at his associate pastor at a church near Seattle. I got to facilitate evangelism and discipleship and assimilation, and then later youth ministry not far from Microsoft's headquarters. It seemed that my dream was being fulfilled, but I had no idea of the third characteristic of the ministry call. It comes with a price. 
You know, many of those who've said yes to God's call have suffered ridicule, persecution, financial loss. They were disowned by their families. Let's see what Paul said about himself in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, in dangers from my own countrymen, in dangers from the Gentiles, danger from the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. I've labored in toiled and often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and often gone without food. I've been cold and naked beside everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? You know, I used to imagine that ministry would be glorious. I never expected the price. But like Paul described, you feel more deeply the needs of the people that you lead. You know, when I make a mistake that causes someone else pain, it hurts deeply. When someone else is angry or hurts or leaves or falls away from the faith in your ministry, it's hard to not take it personally. When you serve as a staff pastor or an unwise or unloving lead pastor, that can bring pain too. The great H.B. London reported a study of pastors that revealed 80% of them believe that pastoral ministry negatively affects their families. 33% say it's an outright hazard to their ministry. 75% report a significant stress-related crisis at least once in their ministry. 50% feel like they don't, can't do the job well. 40% require, say that they got a conflict with a parishioner at least once a month. 70% say their self-esteem is lower now than when they started in ministry. You know, friend... I want you to know, if you're not certain you're called to ministry, don't do it. If you can do anything else and still be happy, change your major right now. You'll make a lot more money, deal with less stress. But if you're called, it's unescapable. You know, how many times have I felt in my own way, in my own life, the way Jeremiah describes it? He said, oh Lord, I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me when I speak. I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. In my first four years in ministry, I had many great joys, including a growing youth ministry with lots of teens finding Jesus. But the church itself was struggling, and the lead pastor even more so. Eventually, he and his wife split up in a very unpleasant way, and I found myself caught in the middle between them and the church and the denomination. I began to ask God if I'd made a mistake. I knew things would have been so much easier if I'd stayed in the Air Force or become a civilian engineer. Yet, like Jeremiah, he wrote in chapter 15, verse 16 of his book, When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. And that's the good news of the ministry call. That is its promise. The first promise God gives is that you will make a difference. Remember we read that God told Moses in Exodus, Certainly I will be with you, and this is the sign that it is I have sent you. When you have brought the people up out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. After seeing my pastor's family disintegrate, I almost left the ministry. But you know, I took my junior hires to summer camp that year. And I'll never forget that first service. You know, it's that service when the speaker causes all those junior hires to repent. (laughs) Jesus was reminding me he had not released me from my ministry call. And I remember at that invitation, I ran to that altar and I wept right alongside all those snot-nosed kids and I made the commitment to stay faithful to Jesus and the calling He gave me. Several months later, a church invited me to become their lead pastor and it was clearly confirmed by God's calling. And we saw God do great things there over the next eight and a half years as the church tripled in sides with hundreds coming to faith in Jesus. I completed my doctorate at that time. Then God called me again this time to begin teaching at a sister school of Southeastern. Then five years later, after my dean, Dr. Kent Engel, had become president of Southeastern University, he invited me here to become the dean. The interesting thing, though, was just before I got my first call to consider coming to Southeastern, 
I received a Facebook message from a lady who had attended the church I used to pastor. I had not seen her in over three years, but here's what she wrote. Hi, Pastor Allen. You've been on my mind lately. When I prayed and asked the Lord why you're on my mind and your name has been coming out of my mouth, he showed me transparent flames of fire. I'm sure this is a very good thing. I know that fire burns that very hot, like it's transparent, like jet fuel. I feel like the Lord is doing something amazing or about to do something amazing in your life and ministry. Does this mean anything to you? I wrote back that night, Wow, thanks, Jennifer. I'm not really sure what it means. I enjoy teaching at Northwest, but I'm always up for whatever God has. I pray you and your men are well. And she wrote back later that night, Pastor Allen, I pressed in more as to what I saw in the Spirit for you. I see you with transparent flames of fire encircling you. They reach up higher than your head. I see bursts of orange fireballs coming off of you and being sent all over the globe. I believe that God is calling you into the fire of revival to be a fire starter for the kingdom of God. This fire will not go out. It will burn until the coming of the Lord. You will be consumed by this fire and burn hot and bright in you. He is welcoming you into his fire, but he is also telling you it is going to cost you much. <laughs> of course, there were many other ways that God's calling to SEU was confirmed, but I didn't even make the connection with this word until I was sitting with our executive vice president after a day filled with interviews to see if this was going to be the job. And then I suddenly remembered this message, and I pulled out my phone and showed it to him, and he started laughing. And I said, what? And he pointed to his shirt. An SEU shirt just like this one with the fire on the logo. You know, certainly that prophetic word was true. There were definitely some hard elements of this move. But I got to tell you, serving here has been the biggest joy of my life. And you know, if you're called to ministry, God's promise is that you will make a difference and you will be blessed. And he will use you to bless other people. Like he told Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. That blessing can be the tangible, miraculous provision of needs. Often though, it's the intangible joy that knows comes from knowing that your life is making a difference in others' lives. But the best promise of all comes with the call is the promise of His presence. Like He told Joshua, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Or to Jeremiah, I am with you to deliver you. To the Apostle Paul in Acts 18.9, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. Nothing compares to an intimate relationship with God that comes from a partnership with Him in His ministry. Yes, there is a huge price to saying yes to that call, but nothing compares to the joy of sensing His presence with you. You know, if you can't do anything else and be content, again, drop this class, change your major, spare yourself the grief and the stress. But if your heart burns with the passion of Jesus with his heart for people, if being on the mission with him makes your pulse race, if the Holy Spirit is giving you a confirmation at this moment, say yes to him today. Let's pray. God, I am only one of the countless people you have called to ministry through history. Many of my friends who are viewing this lecture video today know they are called, and I pray your Holy Spirit would confirm that call in them right now. As they read through the scriptures for this first writing assignment, Lord, I pray you would bring that confirmation. But Lord, there are others taking this class they are not sure. They need to hear from you to get that confirmation if you have indeed called them to ministry. And I pray, Lord, you would send it. And Lord, if they've taken this course and declared this ministry major for some other reason, maybe they're trying to please somebody else. You haven't called them. I pray you would give them a piece to say no and let it go. You can use them elsewhere. But Lord, for all of us who are called, I pray you would ignite a passion for you and a commitment to your gospel that will never cease. Let your fire burn in our hearts always. Anoint us and empower us in Jesus' name. Amen.